Hello? Hello? <coughs> Testing technology. <coughs> Nothing? Yes, something. My voice comes through the line like a worm. Well, I'm afraid the program is going to be a little late this evening because the main supportive technology, the slide projector, has expired on us. I'm getting a strange echo here. Are you getting a strange echo over there too? <laughs> it's like I've been in the jet plane and I've got flu and my ears are plugged up. That wasn't me. I make more impressive noises than that. <laughs> well, there's quite a lot of energy in the room tonight, and uh, I guess there's a lot of interest in animals, and uh, I hope this evening that you really get into a good space trying to understand wolves and what's happening to them, and understanding the relative of the wolf, the dog. Now, as we go along with the slides, projector willing, eventually, <coughs> you'll be exposed to several years of research on the behavior and development of the wolf. Now, I chose to work with the wolf because after five years' work with a domestic dog, rather like the anthropologist, I was stuck. The anthropologist who's looking at urban man, he wants to go and look at a prototype <coughs> human society, and so he goes to the South Sea Islands, he finds it's a very nice place to be and never comes back. Well, unfortunately, I never have been into the wilderness with the wolves. I would probably never return. Most of my studies were done in captivity because I was concerned with the few first few weeks of life. And in the wild, they're really inaccessible then. They're away in a den hiding. I was concerned about trying to get a prototype, prototype canid model because domestication has done so much to the dog. It's changed it in social behavior, in hormonal activity, and so on. And in order to know what I was playing with, Canis familiaris, and a new subspecies that is emerging, Canis over familiaris, <laughs> that's a dependent type that really sucks. <laughs> it, you can never wean it. Perfect child substitute. I decided to look at wolves, coyotes, jackals, and various species of fox. And they really blew my mind to studying ethology in an ecological perspective. Like we have really three different canid types. The red fox, which is very solitary. He's programmed to be that way. Little baby red fox plays with his litter mates until it's about five months of age. And then the parents leave the young. And then aggression in the young kind of explodes things. They don't develop any close social relationships and they split. And they live a relatively solitary life. They're small, they hunt a little bit of food which is widely dispersed. If they were to hunt in packs, imagine a pack of foxes chasing one mouse. The bioeconomics of that would uh, be very maladaptive and some individuals would starve. But in order to live a solitary life, you have to be very independent. And this is the characteristic of the fox. A very young fox is extremely inquisitive and outgoing. Compare that to the third type of canid, the wolf, where you have a wide range of temperaments within each litter. It's a remarkable example of genetic selection <coughs> for heterogeneity of temperament in the wolf litters. You have one or two that are very outgoing, they become the leaders. You have some middle ranking ones who are kind of the middle of the sandwich of the pack, and then a few low ranking ones who are really very spooky and who literally could not survive alone. As they grow up, they have a very strong social affinity for each other. Eventually, a dominance hierarchy develops, and practically each litter is a potential pack. Now, a second type of canid, an intermediate form, is a coyote. 
In some areas where there's an abundance of food, the young will not disperse. They'll stay with the parents and help them raise another litter, rather like the wolves do normally. In other areas where the food is very scarce, the litter leaves the parents around about 11 months of age. And usually in a coyote litter, you don't see such a, a great variation in temperament. The jackal follows the same picture in Africa. So essentially, we're getting a handle on temperaments, genetics, r related to the ecological niche that the animal lives in. Well, a couple of summers ago in Point Barrow, Alaska, I'm just giving a free rap, by the way. <laughs> uh, a couple of summers ago in Point Barrow, we started to use some biotelemetry to, to monitor the heart rate in various situations in our litters. And we found that the highest resting heart rates, about 240 beats a minute, were found in the most outgoing cubs at eight weeks of age. The low-ranking ones had very low heart rates indeed. Now, wh what does this mean? We're getting a handle now on the physiology which seems to underlie the basic temperament that's there. Sure, interactions with adults and so on could determine the later development of the phenotype of behavior. But in our, in our particular litters that were just kept with their mothers, we could pick out at eight weeks of age which character is going to be number one, and a year later and two years later now, these same individuals with the same characteristics are now the dominant ones in the litter. Let's consider this f from a slight comparative angle. It's been shown in squirrel monkeys and chickens, barnyard chickens. The dominant ones have a very different heart rate from middle ranking and low ranking ones. And if you take a low ranking squirrel monkey from one group, and put him into a group where he rises in rank, his heart rate changes. So we're dealing with a phenomenon here, a physiological index related to the social milieu of the animal. In our wolf cubs, it seems to be tied in more with their basic temperament. But we can predict that as the social situation changes, his rank, his role, if you like, there will be physiological changes too. People who have kept wolves have noted how one young wolf is really nice and friendly, until he becomes alpha or leader wolf. Suddenly, he in a way develops an ego and he will challenge you when you go into the enclosure. He might start attacking strange wolves or strange dogs that come near. But quite dramatically, there is a, a change in temperament. We don't know yet what physiological changes are occurring too. In terms of the re release of plasma-bound corticosteroids and so on, the high-ranking wolf cubs are very different. So what, are we, what is this leading into? Well, first of all, how modifiable is the phenotype? You've probably heard of some of the work by developmental psychobiologists where you can get hold of a baby rat and give it a little bit of stress during a very critical or sensitive period early in life. Then you let it grow up. You find that it matures sexually much faster than normal. You find that when you give it some stress such as terminal starvation or cold exposure, it can withstand that stress much longer than a litter mate that hasn't had this kind of exposure. You put it in a learning situation, like running through a maze. It keeps its cool, it does pretty well. By a little bit of early stress, we can modify the phenotype. Now, one Russian fellow, Arshevsky, has been doing this with children to modify the phenotype, and claims that with a little bit of early handling stress, a kind of enrichment program, these children mature much faster than normal and have a higher IQ at age five. Well, we did an experiment with this with dogs. And we confirmed that under stressful situations, they kept their cool. They solved problems better because they were less emotional, solving barriers and detours and so on. And again, we looked at their heart rates. And just as in our wolf cubs, they had a much higher resting heart rate. Now, what has been happening is that with early stress, you modify the relationship between the adrenals and the pituitary, and you kind of zoop up the amount of sympathetic tone that's there, the relationship between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. You have a very different beast on your hands. Now think of this in terms of <clears throat> an environment bringing out the best in an animal. A few years ago, some characters from California, Bennett, Kresch, Rosenzweig, and Dement, got some rats, they didn't actually give them this early handling stress, but they gave them an enrichment program. They took them out of their sterile little cages and put them in play pens, about 20 rats in a cage with some objects to play with. <clears throat> and these rats had bigger brains after a few weeks. And they solved problems much better. 
Well, one of the authors, I think he wrote it up in Saturday Review or something, we have produced superior problem-solving animals. But really, this is not the case. What these researchers have shown is that a rat in a single cage is a very deprived beast. Give it more varied stimulation to optimize its development, and you have a very different behavioral phenotype when it grows up. The same holds true, perhaps, in our domestic dogs, too. And this is one of the chapters that I put in Understanding Your Dog, the possibility of considering not excessive handling stress, but avoid overswaddling. Now, to get back to our Shevsky, the Russians have notoriously, for generations, overswaddled their children. They keep them in these tight little blankets so they can literally not move. And he's found that releasing this inhibition and giving them lots of varied stimulation, taking them out into the cold taiga, letting them see the Arctic lights, switching the lights off and the heat up and down in the house, rocking them to and fro and so on, alters the arousal state of the organism. And we have a very different beast when it grows up. The army are now using this heart rate as a very sensitive indicator in their super dog project, the biosensor research project, where they have German shepherds as their basic animal. And they find that monitoring heart rate within litters, they might as well give up with a litter that has a very low heart rate. But the heart rate is an indicator of some kind of latent potential there. Now, our physiologists have always been telling us about the autonomic nervous system. However, psychologists have done very little in this area yet, or behaviorists. And I think this is something very important to get onto, especially for you people in veterinary school, too. And some of the slides will address this problem later, of how the vegetative or autonomic nervous system is tied up with the emotions and tied up with immune responses and resistance to disease. Just imagine a rat, sorry, a mouse, that normally develops spontaneous leukemia at a given age, or is extremely susceptible to certain implanted tumors. It's been shown that early handling stress can delay the onset of leukemia and can almost arrest the development of certain implanted tumors. So this is switching around now from not only a physiology of behavior, but a more holistic view of medicine. And I think this is what we really need in our conceptual thinking as we approach disease problems. Thinking about little red fox and his ecosystem. It's a particular temperament related to the environment. Philosophers have said for years, you cannot separate the organism from its environment. It's kind of a mystical rap, that is, sure. But in terms of adaptation and evolution, this is certainly true. What have we done, though? We've taken ourselves from a natural environment. We've taken our domestic animals with us and are creating environments around them. This gives us almost godlike responsibilities to consider variables which we ourselves are introducing. And it makes the picture extremely complex, but no less real. And I really wish that more people in my area of animal behavior, ethology, would study the domestic animals too. Rather like the anthropologists, they would sooner something, study something a little more exotic, which is rather a waste of energy at times. Is that slide projector obedient now? It is, okay. Would you like to introduce me? <laughs> this is one time that uh, technolo technological problems have been overcome. Our, uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Fox. He's a British veterinarian and associate professor of psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. His field is veterinary ethology, his specialty is canine behavior. I'm sure he's going to be very interesting. I've already learned from him tonight how to play darts. <laughs> Can we have the first slide there, please? I want to focus in immediately on the uh, social life of the wolf to put you into its conceptual world, really. <clears throat> As we go along, you will learn quite a bit about the dog, too. A portrayal of man adapting. <laughs> Thank you. 
No, I don't want that slide. I want to start at the beginning. That's the one solitary slide that you would choose. <laughs> I don't want those either. <coughs> That's the beginning. <coughs> the beginning is always birth. I think conception might be better. This is a she-wolf in the den. Notice the cubs. They're very dark at birth. This is the first mystery that strikes us. Why are all wild canids dark at birth? It might be something to do with heat regulation. We don't know. Now, basically, the whole social life of the wolf pack focuses around the litter. Aunts and uncles will babysit and will bring food to the cubs. Usually, it's only the dominant or alpha female that breeds. This is the first thing that impresses us, is the birth control within a wolf pack. They're not all, all out having an orgy during the breeding season. There's a very careful regulation of who breeds. It's usually the dominant female that breeds. She subordinates other females that are in heat, and they do not breed. It's not always the alpha wolf, the alpha male, who is the leader of the pack, who breeds. It's a female who has the choice. So right on with women's lib for number one. Usually a pack is an extended family <clears throat> with a leader female and a leader male. And there are yearling wolves around, perhaps from a previous year's litter. Survival rates are normally very low. A wolf doesn't come into heat until two years of age. All wild canids that we've studied so far come into heat at one year of age. The wolf, no, not until two. Now, slipping into a Marcusean thought, this might be a very adaptive mechanism of delaying sexual maturity to ensure that the young will stay around an extra year to stay with the maternal pack and help them raise another litter. A little bit of teleology there. But compared to the dog, the wolf only has one heat a year. <clears throat> Dogs have two. Some breeds now have three heats a year. Wolves, so far as we know, have very specific mate preferences. There's a myth that they might mate for life, but they don't usually live long enough for us to determine that. They do show very clear mate preferences. Now, if you had a stud, stud dog that showed very clear mate preferences, it wouldn't be much use using him. So we've not only made dogs more sexual in terms of their endocrine activity, having at least two heats a year, we've necessarily made them more promiscuous so that we can selectively breed them more easily. The male wolf <coughs> has a season too. He produces sperm just during the breeding season. Our male dogs are very different from that. They're always fertile. Just while we're making a few more quick comparisons, an interesting thing happens in the wolf cub's temperament as it grows up. Around about five months of age, he becomes increasingly afraid of novel stimuli in a familiar place. Say a cardboard box in a place that it shouldn't be. The animal will just freak out completely and will run away. <coughs> this is the emergence of wildness, trait in quotes. It's very adaptive in the wild because around this age, the cub is beginning to learn his home range, which might be 700 or 1,000 square miles. And a mature wolf knows every detail of his terrain. And he soon learns to respond to the unfamiliar. He also responds to unfamiliar wolves and unfamiliar strange people, too, if you happen to be hand-raising a wolf. And this is highly adaptive in keeping wolf packs together. Wolves avoid strangers. They avoid contact with strange wolves. They either avoid them or some of the dominant wolves will drive strangers away. Because it's important for any hunting group, whether it's human or animal, to keep an optimal size. It's not only important to control the birth rate, but also the numbers of individuals that you recruit into your ranks that are stragglers from other packs or who don't have a territory for one reason or another. <clears throat> Occasionally, we see this trait, this temperament developing in domestic dogs around about five months of age. They become increasingly spooky, and they're very hard to handle. They don't normally mature out of this until one and a half to two years of age. The temperament tends to cool out a bit. Another thing that happens in our domestic dog, especially around oh, one to one and a half years of age, is increasing aggression towards their owners. And this is related to sexual maturity. 
Sure, this dog's been breeding from six months of age on, but there's a delay in the central aspects of territoriality and sexuality, which in my conceptualization are closely related. There's a wolf or a wild canid matures sexually. It also starts showing increasing defense of its territory towards strangers and will attack intruders. And will start having rivalry fights with you or with some of its companions. The same thing on more or less the same time base begins to develop in the domestic dog. And yet he's sexually mature in terms of endocrine function and fertility much earlier. So the emotional side of his maturation is delayed. And this, I think, is something for somebody to work on in some greater depth of how, in fact, domestication has affected the neuroendocrine system and left the more central emotional aspects of development to still the kind of wild temporal sequence that we see. Okay, to move through the wolf now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the regurgitation of food by the mother. Other adults will do this as well. The wolves use the stomach as a carrying basket and bring food from several miles from a hunt and will regurgitate at the nest or den. It's surprising the number of domestic dogs, bitches, that don't do this. For example, I lecture at the German Shepherd Club of America and I see very few hands of owners who have seen their bitches do this for their cubs. But I go to the Miniature Poodle Club of America and there are dozens of hands. So there's been no selection for or against this particular trait. However, paternal behavior might have been affected because how many domestic dogs today are kept with the puppies, the males? Next slide. Rather like the cub approaching the mother and shoving its muzzle into its mouth to solicit food, so a subordinate will do a very similar behavior of licking inside the dominant wolf's mouth. Not to solicit food anymore, although the dominant one might occasionally throw up, perhaps out of disgust, I don't know. <laughs> this is the first example of a number of behaviors that I'm going to be talking about, which occur in infancy, the food soliciting, but which persist into maturity, the same action, but in a different context now, and having a different function. The function here is to appease the aggressor. It's a ritual display of submission and affection, quite distinct from its initial motivation of soliciting food, but the same actions are there. The next slide shows several cubs greeting the mother, <coughs> Point Barrow, Alaska, at the Naval Lab. Can you hear me at the back all right? Yes, good. They greet her, she gives a little low whine, they become very excited and she throws up. This becomes a greeting ritual in maturity, where the adult wolves show the same behavior to the leader. It's almost as though the leader is kind of a token, totem parent. Next slide. Shows the kind of situation at Brookfield Zoo, t typical captive pack. You can see the leader in the middle. He just stands there, his tail is high, and all the lower ranking wolves are going around, licking his muzzle, gently nibbling it, and showing all kinds of expressions and so on. This is a group display of allegiance to the leader. It's a ritual they perform several times a day. In the wild, they will especially do this before they go out hunting. It brings the group together. Next slide. As you start studying an animal, you have to be very patient to learn its language. <coughs> Conrad Lorenz, the father of ethology, said at a meeting <coughs> in Edinburgh a few years ago, he was opening the meeting, about as many people as there are here today from all over the world, a lot of hard-nosed scientists and so on. He said to the whole group, you must first begin by loving your animal. Wow, what a frightful subjective thing to say. A lot of people going tut, 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 and rattling their mechanistic beads and just thanking that they were statisticians and so on. <clears throat> what Conrad Lawrence was getting into was that one has to be very close to an animal. You have to get into its umwelt, its perceptual world, for a while. If you're going to study catfish or wolves or whatever, you have to be that animal. You have to try to think like it, transmute yourself so you can get inside it. It's a very subjective thing. All, all science is subjective anyway. And then you can step back after a while and become a little more detached in your observing and recording and so on, and then you can get into it. <coughs> a 
This is a simple schema of the facial expressions in Coyote. It's, it's an ethogram. Across this continuum on the top, uh, from way up, you see the ears going back <coughs> and the lips going back into a submissive grin. It's just called a submissive grin. It occurs in particular contexts where one individual is being submissive, so we can give it a label. It's just like the junior in the office in the morning saying, hi, boss. He doesn't show his teeth, he just puts the lips back. You can study various species of monkey, primates, apes and monkeys, and you see almost identical expressions there. These are homologous to the evolving facial expressions in man. <coughs> Another one is the open mouth threat, with a snarl and a direct stare, increasing intensity here. The coyote, this is a coyote, also has an aggressive pucker where the lips are just pushed forward. This is typical of primates. Look next time somebody gets angry. The lips go forward. The pursed lips expression. Along this continuum is a simultaneous combination, an overlay or a superimposition of this expression and the expression of the submissive grin. The lips are pushed back submissively and the mouth is opened in threat. We would call this a fear biter or an animal who is showing two simultaneously combined emotions. He's in a state of conflict. So you can read where he's at. It's the same in human beings now. A group in California are doing videotapes at high speed to look at disgust reactions in people. We all have one that goes, mm. it lasts about 1 20th of a second or 1 50th. It's very fleeting. But you can monitor a lot of these almost micro expressions which, which are contracted because of our language for one reason and often masked because we want to cover up and always seem to be smiling. Mm. And uh, we can get a lot of data. Next slide will show you some living pictures of these. <coughs> this is a wolf, <coughs> Lulu, doing courtship with a Malmi. The most beautiful expression to it, confidence. This is the open mouth play face. It's analogous to laughter in man. Next time you meet a dog, go up to it and say, how are you doing? Always talk to your animals, talk to plants, talk to everything. It doesn't matter what you say, it's what you feel that comes out. We do too much talking, too much bullshit. Get your feelings out and talk to the dog and then suddenly go <laughs> <laughs> and the dog will just freak out. <laughs> because first of all, it's incongruous for a person to do this. But it's a very specific dog signal. It means let's play. It's analogous to laughter. Wolves and dogs and coyotes only have the open mouth play face, open mouth pant play face. <laughs> But little foxes, red foxes, can put a vocal overtone into it. <laughs> so you can sense the laughter there. And then you go to a chimpanzee, <laughs> and it's all there. So we, have, we can use our minds to, to show that we can communicate, we, and we can do it anyway. The guy who's hugging her is showing a submissive grin combined with beginnings of an open mouth face. The corners of the lips are being turned up. Next slide. This will focus a little sharper, I think. I hope these are clear at the back with these lights on. <coughs> Can you focus? Focus needs to twiddle the knob. On the front. Is it focusing? Good. These are all copies, but it, some of them don't look too good. This is subordinate showing a submissive grin to the leader very clearly. Lips back. And next slide. As a sequence, this will focus better too. He, he is forcibly pinned to the ground and held there. This is an example of ritualized aggression in the wolf. The jaws never close. Like we develop weapons and we had to develop certain taboos and laws about how they're used. Wolves also have these laws. A lot of them are, are inbuilt. A young wolf cub has a very gentle mouth indeed, even though he's never played with another wolf cub. You hand raise a domestic dog without any play contact with its own kind, and it will bite very hard indeed. He has to learn through a social experience how hard he must bite. It's recently been shown that there are so many nerves around the canine teeth in carnivores that the canine teeth are as sensitive as your fingertips. It's very important if you're a neck biter, like a felid, where you have to feel your way between the vertebrae to shear between those. So
cervical things and get it just right. So for any dog who breaks a kid's skin, you know, with a real puncture wound, a real bite, if he ever does it again, he should be destroyed. We can select for soft mouth, you know, the story of the bird dogs and so on, that don't bruise. A dog is capable of giving an inhibited bite too. Makes a lot of noise, <coughs> but the jaws never close. It, there might be a slight bruise on the child's arm or face, which is accidental. I have phone calls from owners. My dog has attacked my child. What shall I do? I said, well, how many stitches were there? Oh, it's just a bruise. I'll give your dog a medal and tell your child how to relate to the dog, because the dog was probably saying, get the hell away from here. <coughs> However, there are situations where dogs suddenly become disinhibited. The normal social inhibitions of the bite suddenly break down. One should admittedly look into the context before deciding upon euthanasia. We do have many hysterical dogs emerging now because the dog is becoming increasingly a commodity item, puppy palace and all these chain stores and so on, selling St. Bernard's and other beasts at a great price but like commodities. People see them, they've never thought of getting a dog, they're just going out, you know, it's their weekend shopping spree. Everybody gets high in this culture going out to spend money because they've been programmed to do this. <coughs> And so they're going out to buy something that they can't quite articulate what yet. And then suddenly they pass Puppy Palace. Wow! You know, the little puppy there, it's a total releaser of all your visceral feelings of something to give attention and affection to. Or you might want to buy it for mother or somebody like that. So you buy this thing with a pedigree so long, with veterinarian signatures and all kinds of stuff. There is no quality control going on now. <clears throat> the Saint Bernard used to be a fantastic animal. We now know that it's a very unreliable beast from many kennels. They're attacking owners at age between one and two. They're literally becoming psychotic. What is going on? Surely in some situations it's the owners that are affecting the animal. But I think what we have to be very careful about now is what animals breeders are pushing onto the market in terms of these very defective temperaments. I'll return to this shortly in a moment. Okay, this is ritualized assertion of dominance. Next slide shows a close-up at St. Louis Zoo, father disciplining cub. Wolves are very indulgent parents. They take a lot of nonsense from their cubs, pulling their ears and tails and so on. But they do discipline them too. They do put them in their place. And very soon the cub learns to submit. He learns his position. The next slide shows alpha wolf, dominant wolf on the left, subordinating number two wolf at London Zoo. Now, wolves, you re read, read the behavior, what's going on. <coughs> He's seizing the muzzle. We know structurally it's much harder for a canid to open his jaws against pressure than it is to close. <coughs> much easier to close them. We know that when we muzzle a dog, he suddenly submits. A very effective way of disciplining a dog, just like alpha wolf, let alpha wolf teach you, is to seize him around the muzzle <coughs> and close his jaws. You might also hold the unruly dog by the scruff and shake him as well. Muzzle closure is extremely effective. There are certain parts of animals' bodies that when you touch them, really switch on some kind of behavior, have a profound psychological effect. Just think of your own erotogenic areas. These are more social avenues where animals can communicate and can affect each other. <coughs> I'll talk about the groin area shortly, which is an important psychological area in the dog and wolf and so on. An important psychological area in the cat is the scruff. Pick a kitten up and it curls up immobile. Highly adaptive for the mother to carry the kittens around when she wants to change the nest site. This immobility response persists when a male wants to dominate another male. And he will seize a low-ranking male around the scruff and will mount him. We label this a sexual behavior, but it's not sexual behavior. He's not a pervert or a homosexual. He's asserting his dominance over him. Similarly, the male will immobilize the female this way during breeding. Next slide. We can communicate with animals because we use a very common channel of communication, the eyes. A direct stare is a threat. A looking away is submissive. Conrad Lawrence, in a couple of his books, said that a submissive dog exposes his jugular vein as a sign of complete surrender. Well, we know that not to be a very exact interpretation. 
A submissive dog doesn't expose his throat. He doesn't know he's got a damn jugular vein there anyway. He's not been to vet school and learned his anatomy. <laughs> what he does is to roll over onto his side and piddle just like a puppy. If he exposes anything, it's his abdominal anogenital region. What is going on, however, say this is the, the dominant guy here, what is going on is that the subordinate is looking away and then looking towards in a rather exaggerated fashion. It's like somebody who's being submissive who's a primate. We look away. A lot of the primates who go to the zoo, they have eye shadow, an inherited pigment which develops white, sometimes blue on the upper eyelids, simply to enhance these displays of submission of looking away, of closing the eyes and turning away. Where are we? Yes. So, here, Brookfield Zoo, we have dominant wolf threatening subordinate with a direct stare. You notice the subordinate damn look. He's just standing there. In fact, within the pack, within a group of primates, within a group of people, there's a whole attention structure of who is looking at who. Who is looking at whom, sorry. <coughs> Notice here the very sheepish, wolfish expression on this animal. He knows that something is going on there. This is really very significant. A few months ago, I was having lunch with a graduate student. Had this enormous malmute. And I gave the pant face <laughs> to the dog, which meant, let's play. And then I went, <laughs> did a tooth snap. And his dog, his pupils dilated, his hackles raised, and he leapt at me <laughs> and grabbed my arm. Well, I feigned that I was severely injured. And Mark, who's, who'd been watching animals, you know, for two years, writing down every tail wag, le leapt up and said, my God, are you all right? I said, I'm fine. And it was just an inhibited bite. The animal didn't even close his jaws. He shook his head, though, as though he was really crunching me. And I was scared, I tell you. <laughs> because the dog didn't respond to my play signal with a tail wag or a play bow or a pant or anything like that. What had happened was that I'd set the stage, so to speak, by saying, let's play. And this guy had some confidence, and he went right into it without a reciprocal stage-setting signal. We call this setting of the stage metacommunication, where Mark's dog knew that I knew that it knew that I knew that it knew that I knew that it knew. It's a reciprocal awareness of context. Now, you might say, well, this is very anthropomorphic, but it ain't. It's demonstrated here. Although this wolf isn't being threatened, he knows what's going on. He has certain expectations when he meets certain wolves. He's, he's learned things, sure, which in itself sets up metacommunication. I'll show you some urban dogs later that we've been studying. Throughout 90 hours of observation, direct observation, we've only had 16 bouts of any kind of social behavior. One bout is a tail wag that lasts that long. Another bout is just a nose push. 16 bouts in 90 hours. We see hardly any overt behavior except looking. And these animals are just bound up in the most subtle communication system, not ESP, let's not mystify it. The most subtle metacommunicative bond uh, is present between these animals, that they know what's going on. They are aware all the time of what context they're in. So there is no redundancy in excessive signaling. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a touched up photo of a domestic dog turning away in this exaggerated fashion when being intimidated by a superior. The turning away Avoidance of eye contact looks as though the animal is exposing his throat, but he's not. Next slide. When you look at animals or people relating, look how they orient towards each other. You know, you might have two guys talking like this, and then one guy, he's not too interested. Yes, well, I think that's really interesting what you're saying. And he keeps making intention movements to move away. Very neat to watch children that way, too. You know, the body gets cut in half. One half is doing this, and the other half is doing something else. Look how they orient towards each other. Here we have two male dogs approaching. The orientation is very specific. If they keep this position, this one is threatening. Then there'll be a reciprocal kind of circle until one stands and the other investigates. Always look how they orient towards each other. Next slide shows this in action. Three low-ranking wolves approaching the dominant one. Notice how they're orienting. All three of them, one, two, three, are all oriented the same way. 
as they approach him sideways. Sideways, like a cub approaching mother for food. If you approach a dog and say you're a good dog judge in the show ring, you'll all approach, always approach sideways. Good dog handlers, good showmen always approach the dog sideways. They know intuitively not to approach front on because the dog might take it as a threat. The same goes for handling horses too. The same is in the law of the wolf, well exemplified here. There's another aspect of this story too. I alluded to earlier misinterpreting the male cat who's mounting another male cat as something sexual, but in fact it's purely social. We have something analogous to that in the wolf. The alpha wolf is just sitting there minding his own business, and then suddenly two or three subordinates run over like this and <laughs> start whining. Suddenly, he's a different animal. He's up on his toes like this, his hackles are raised, and he pins each one to the ground. If you were suddenly to come onto that scene, you'd say, well, that's aggressive. It's dominance behavior. And our Aristotelian minds are satisfied with that. But this is really a non-Aristotelian phenomenon. It's not simple logic. Something else is happening here. That aggression has become highly ritualized and emancipated from its original cause in this particular context. And now it has a group binding function. The subordinates approach the leader as a display of allegiance and affection and submission. And he behaves in a would-be, seeming to us an aggressive way of growling, pile of erection, and pinning them to the ground. Very often afterwards he will whine. Sometimes while he's growling and threatening them, he will whine. They will urinate, and he, like a parent, will lick up the urine after they've piddled. So this whole behavior is a very ritualized form of aggression which is no longer aggressive. The same story holds true for the evolution of sexual behavior in things like rhesus monkeys. <coughs> you go to the zoo, <coughs> I went when I was six with Auntie, and Auntie always used to run by the rhesus monkeys because, you know, just like Freud said and the pasta, they're like the naked human id, they're just hypersexed, they're always mounting each other and doing all these terrible things. But in fact, what is going on is purely dominant submission. A subordinate male will present himself in a female-like posture to a higher-ranking female. And so these action patterns are no longer being used in a sexual context, but more in the social context associated with dominance and submission. I'm emphasizing this because you have to be really darn careful how you interpret animal behavior, how you interpret particular actions. You have to follow long sequences of behavior. You have to sit there for hours and record what happens before and what happens after so that you can get a, your hands onto the context in which the behaviors are occurring because you might see the same action in different contexts. Next slide, please. This is the subordinate posture, submissive posture in a wolf, rolling over onto one side, elevating the uppermost hind leg, urinating a little, and so on. Many wild canids have white bellies. And this enhances the display of submission, of rolling over. See, a little bit of white here, and it's all black wool, just to enhance this display. Next slide. Just like a white flag of surrender. Now, another behavior that's derived from infancy is genital grooming. On the left is the dominant wolf. He approaches a lower-ranking one and stands there, which is an invitation to groom. And the subordinate goes forwards and briefly licks the genitals. The next picture shows one lying down. The other one walked over and went, <laughs> which is a signal, groom me, if you wish, or whatever, and they groom. This occurs especially between wolves that have a pretty close bond, independent of sex. It, it also occurs quite often after a little skirmish, rather like grooming in primates reduces tension in the group, so this genital grooming reduces tension. Next slide. This is derived from infancy this grooming behavior. When a little wolf cub is in the nest, if he was urinating and defecating all the time, that den would soon be a stink pot. So there's a very nice adaptive piece of behavior. He only eliminates when mother licks the nether quarters and she ingests everything. When she's licking the nether quarters, he remains quite still because the inguinal region is being touched, the groin. He remains quite passive. And this behavior persists into maturity. It behaves like a cub in quotes, as an adult, towards superiors. It will go and present the groin, and the other will respond and groom. It will regress and behave even more like a cub 
by rolling over onto one side, lifting that uppermost hind leg and urinating a little. Here we have a young cub approaching mother, giving a face-oriented kiss, and he's squeezing his hip round. And, and the next thing that the mother did was to briefly lick the hindquarters. No, notice next time you handle a dog, a friendly dog that's coming forwards, wiggling its hips and smiling at you. And then he brings his hips around, just touch him there. And he'll either stand like a rock, or he'll roll over submissively and urinate at your feet. <laughs> a lot of people call me up and say, I have this dog that every time I, I pet him, he urinates. Well, don't pet him. And eventually they grow out of it. I did have one dog, though, that even if I looked at him, he'd urinate. It's terrible. <laughs> had an awful inferiority complex or something. <laughs> Next slide. Shows domestic dog doing the same thing to uh, a puppy, cleaning it. The puppy remains quite still, will sometimes elevate the hind leg, although that's not common. Next slide. Coyote during social investigation will often elevate the hind leg and will just stand rock still. It's analogous, if you like, to human handshake, where you more passively present your hand and somebody else shakes it but the human handshake isn't derived from anything in infancy like this is. Next slide. Shows how the inguinal response, this is a very messed up picture. This young male is immobilizing the female here with a bilateral clasp. And there is in fact a change in threshold in the skin sensitivity in the groin area when a bitch comes into heat. You touch one groin side and she will present towards you. Touch them both and she will stand like a rock. And this is how the male effectively immobilizes the female. He doesn't use a scruff bite. He uses an inguinal or groin clasp. And this holds her. Next slide. People are aware of this behavior at dog shows. That they will touch their dogs under the groin, like this guy is doing. Not just to position the hind feet, but simply to, to quieten the dog down. And a good dog handler will do this intuitively. He's not sure why. He'll talk to the dog, go down its head, and then just kind of run his hand around under the groin. A very friendly thing to do to a dog. It's a psychologically very significant area. Next slide. <coughs> Just to close that little sequence on the inguinal response. Et tu, Brutus. <laughs> As from a great height. Next slide, please. Now, the wolf is a remarkable beast. It's probably the most highly evolved predator, mammal, on the North American continent. It hunts in packs. We used to hunt in packs, too. For 99% of our speciation as Homo sapiens, we were hunter-gatherers. Only for the last 10,000 years have we had agriculture, and only for the last 200 have we had technology. We're a rel relatively new subspecies. Much of our ancestry is based upon a very similar way of life, bioeconomically, and perhaps socially, too. But the wolf is being destroyed in this country the pioneer spirit, man's ego, making the ecosystem into a global ego system. It's a great tragedy. The wolf is killed for sport. Where farmers came in, they kicked the Indians out and gave some of them some land upon which to live. And the corporations are now trying to kick the Indians off their land so they can get into their strip mines now. <laughs> so the Indians are supposed to live off our cities, I suppose, in the slums. The wolf wasn't given any sanctuary whatsoever. And there are wolves now in Alaska and Minnesota, and that's about it. Where wolves were removed, Department of the Interior Wildlife people had to move in. And we have wildlife managers going in to kill off the excess deer every year. When you remove a natural predator, you start the domino effect going. An ecological imbalance occurs. In areas where there were no wolves, the deer become too numerous. They overbrowse, and the population crashes. This has happened in a number of places. In Sweden now, where I think there are four wolves, the eagles, the ravens, the wolverines, the arctic fox, the red fox, and the arctic owl are on the decline now. Because these, these animals maintain themselves primarily on the carrion, on the leftovers of wolf kills. So the repercussions are enormous. Probably you know the repercussions of poisons that our government has been using too, such as 1080, indiscriminate poisoning. A coyote comes along and eats the poison bait, has a horrible death. A badger or a skunk might eat a little bit of that carcass, and an eagle, they too will die, and so on and so on. The chain reactions are incredible. 
you know, the, the attitudes that we're dealing with in wildlife management and so on really see a more objective view, not of a humanist, not necessarily of a humanist, but of a scientist, somebody scientifically trained, like a veterinarian, who doesn't have tunnel vision. You're taught physiology, which makes you understand medicine, pathophysiology and so on. You have a more holistic view of things. And many of the people who are in fact controlling much of this country today, indiscriminate poisoning, trapping and so on, has really ruined much of the wilderness. You might ask, well, why should we preserve the wilderness when we need it for human resources? I say we should find a more compatible way to live because the spirit of humanity is really suffering in this country. Next slide. Some people are trying to get back into it in various ways. The encounter group, sensitivity training, and so on. I was watching Jane Goodall's film on the chimps the other night, and these chimps are whooping it up. They've got it. They know where it's at. They're in touch with their feelings. We, our educational program, teaches just one part of us, our biocomputers, our heads, the one little part of our heads where we put facts in. A diet too rich in facts leads to cerebral diarrhea, an important definition. You vomit for the examination, <clears throat> and that's it. We have to educate the whole body and the whole mind, the visceral, emotional, social aspects as well. Teach a child at school more social skills, and less of this cognitive stuff. And these are people desperately trying to find something in their lives that they think is missing, and this probably is missing. Next slide, some people find an answer another way. They go out and kill. This is a picture taken up from Canada, where these guys go once a year to a village <clears throat> and see how many wolves they can kill. The one fellow killed 46 that, that weekend and got the prize. I know what I would like to give him. <laughs> Psychiatrists interpret this in many ways. You know, they give the usual Freudian interpretation. We might say, well, man needs some status and identity based on his old hunting programs in his head to bring a trophy back, and it might well be tied in with that. I think these minds can be reprogrammed so that they will shoot wolves many times with a camera instead of once with a gun. It might take a long time. I see problems of conservation, problems of pollution, problems of war, and so on, all tied up to one very simple thing, human awareness, that we have to really get into a consciousness-raising trip if we're going to save much around us. It's no use fighting government or fighting a particular problem. You have to work within the people to change their concept of reality, to work within these men and within their children to help them understand the wolf. It's no use saying, well, you've got no right to hunt because wolves have a right to live. These are pioneer men, a lot of them. They have every right to do whatever they like, because in the wilderness, man is king. You can't fight an ego with the hopes of destroying it. You can try to get behind it so the man within it will understand it and will perhaps transcend it. It's not easy. Next slide. Well, to get back to home base now, to domestic dog, <coughs> a few practical things, a few veterinarians. As a puppy matures, its first thing to do is to follow. Increasing the track to a handler. This puppy has met a person for the first time at five weeks. Wow! Wags his tail and follows him around. This puppy meets the person for the first time at eight weeks. A much lower tendency to follow, and he even avoids a passive person. If this puppy has no contact with people until he's about 12 weeks of age, you can't get near him at all. And this is work of Scott and Fuller at Bar Harbor, who have shown that there is a critical period for socializing dogs, just like the critical period for socializing children. This is why it's so important now in orphan foster programs and so on to get the infant at a very early age so you can establish a very close bond with it. This is very true for the dog. If socialization is delayed, it's not sufficiently human-oriented. It's very hard to train. It might become a canine delinquent as it grows up, but usually overindulgence does that instead. If you take a dog when it's very young, say four or five weeks of age, and overindulge and keep it just with you and don't give it sufficient experience with other dogs, it can literally think itself it's a human being. You might think, well, this is far out. But this has been experimented with many animals. Conrad Lorenz discovered it first with ravens and crows. He hand-raised them. He was their mother. When they reached sexual maturity, they tried to mount his hand, and they would court his hand. 
when the time came when they should have had a nest and babies to feed, they would pick up grubs and they would try to shove them down his ear and nose. <coughs> Heine Hedegger had a moose, one of his keepers hand raised, this enormous male moose. It was totally imprinted to people. The keeper took the moose into an enclosure of female moose, meese, whatever, and the moose became very excited and tried to mount his keeper. <laughs> All as a consequence of this socialization programming. It becomes a problem of conservation, too. Imagine a zoo with an exotic, rare little animal that they carefully cherish and hand raise. It doesn't even have a mirror to know what it might look like. And suddenly they find a mate for it, but it's too late now. The imprint has been made that it is attached emotionally to people. We've done this raising one dog with a litter of cats. The dog literally thinks he's a cat. He won't respond to his own mirror image, for example. The cats have the best of both worlds if they've been raised with a puppy. They will play happily with all cats, of course, and with all dogs they will try to play too. They're very well adjusted, although of course that could be risky. It does say quite a lot for integrative schooling, too. That with early, broad-based socialization, a lot can be gained. The xenophobic reactions are eliminated. OK, next slide. It's just a picture of guide dogs to the blind, various tests that they do to evaluate these dogs. They find critically here that independent of any genetic selection, that if these puppies are kept with their mothers until they're about 10 weeks of age, they will not test out well at six months. You've got to get the puppy away at six weeks of age from all other dogs and put it in a home with kids and all kinds of noise going on, into a foster home, which is what they do in the San Rafael program. Put the puppy in a foster home, get it very people-oriented. Sure, take it into the park and let it meet other dogs occasionally just to keep the contact going. But if you keep it, with its litter mate or with its mother until it's about 12 weeks of age, it will be too dog-oriented. It will be very hard to train. Next slide. Well, we did an experiment looking at exploratory behavior in puppies. This is a little puppy who was put in this arena full of various things. A flashing red light, a rat in a cage, a mirror, another on, odd demand. So as he got older, he explored more and more and more. It was neat. Nice little spidery things everywhere. As he got older, he preferred more complex stimuli like the rat and the mirror. Well, litter mates, we gave a different treatment to. Some litter mates we put in for the first time at five weeks, and that was it. They explored like that. Another group we put in once at eight weeks, and they explored just like that. Another group we put in at 12 weeks, and they didn't explore. They stayed in the sharp start box. They shivered, defecated. Some even went into a, an almost trance-like Pavlovian displacement sleep. They were terrified. The final group at 16 weeks that we put in, in this novel environment behaved just the same way. They were terrified. Now these pups had all been raised together with the same amount of human handling in a big kennel. They'd never been allowed out of the kennel. There seems to be a very critical period, sometime after eight weeks, toward 12 weeks, when if a puppy isn't taken into an environment where he has varied stimulation, he'll withdraw. His brain is literally getting overloaded. We have good EEG evidence for that. What are the practical implications of this? <clears throat> First, a growing organism, child or puppy or whatever, has receptors to engage its environment, to touch, to smell, to feel, to do everything with. <clears throat> we should give it varied stimulation. If we raise it under deprivation or with low input, we know that it will choose low input later in life. A friend of mine at Harlow's lab worked with rhesus monkeys. He raised one group in isolation, the other group normally. At six months of age, monkeys like to look at test cards that have lots of crisses and crosses on them. At about three months of age, they'd sooner look at a less complex card, just with a couple of crosses on it. When he tested the isolates at six months of age, they preferred to look at the less complex card, just with one or two crisses crosses on it. They couldn't tolerate, if you like, they preferred not to look at the more complex stimuli. Now consider this in terms of IQ and intelligence. So the whole key to intelligence is exploring the environment, getting increments of experience, engaging the environment with all your receptors. If, however, the set point is so adjusted that too much stimulation causes withdrawal after a critical point, it's possible that if that set point is low, the organism will not take up enough information. It's rather like an autistic, in a sense. <clears throat> 